So please put your hands together for Patrick, everyone. The topic was, it's a glorious day, and you're going to have a question at the end, how I could possibly fit this story into that. Uh, my father was six foot four and weighed 270 pounds. So, you're wondering. <laughs> and people always said, you know, I'd take after my mother, or my father would say, maybe that guy down the street. <laughs> but my father shrunk around his father-in-law. And one thing I didn't tell them at the time, I'll tell how they met. Uh, my father got out of the service and asked my mother, who was a teenager, for a date on a Saturday night. Before the date, my father always had this problem. If he went to bars, people picked fights with him. So he got beat up, uh, two black guys. So he shows up for the date with my mother, and <laughs> his future father-in-law says, what happened to you? And he says, oh, horrible car accident. <laughs> you, you should see the other uh, car. Not realizing how word travels in a small town, because he realized that over the next several months of dating, as his future father-in-law relentlessly cross-examined him about the details of this car accident, the insurance ramifications, all this set of things. So both men knew that he'd been caught in a lie, but they couldn't go back. So the relationship was built on the foundation of mutual distrust. <laughs> so they get, he, he gets married, and the other problem was both men were salesmen, and the product they were fighting over was my mother. And my father was... My grandfather was a great businessman, my father was not. Like Ralph Cran and the Honeymooners, he had all these great get-rich-quick schemes. And eventually he went bankrupt. So he goes bankrupt, and my mother and us three kids go to live with my grandfather at the Jersey Shore. Uh, we call him Pop-Up, and his wife, Mama, refused to be considered grandmother. So we stay with Pop-Up, and he ran a tight ship. He was a former Air Force guy. He had, uh, every meal was like a... He, he, he sat at the end of the table, presided over every meal. We had to sit there very politely doing that. It was an important part, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Um, he didn't like my father. My father lived in the Philadelphia at the time, would pop in on weekends, and like Friday nights. And my grandfather did not like my father's drinking. So what he would do is he'd um, spend 11 p.m. curfew and lock all the doors in the house. As a result, my father became a very adept burglar. <laughs> You'd scale the, the house, come in at night, slip in, and then in the morning for breakfast, you'd get in like a soldier sneaking in before roll call, and come in and sit at the end of the table with the kids where we sat. My grandfather would shake his head in disgust. That's the background. On the glorious day in question, my father was in the house but missed roll call. He had a long night. We talked about drinking the night. Well, he had a long night. Um, this is the twisted part of the story. After breakfast, my grandfather went out to the garage to do an errand. He was lowering the wooden garage door, and it caught on his finger, cutting it off. Yeah. So my mother rushed him to the hospital. She got him to the hospital. At the hospital, the doctor said, you know, if we get the other end of his finger, we can sew it right back on. So my mother called Frannie to the house, and she asked for my father, because she always believed in my father. And they put my father on the phone, and she said, Frank, go to the garage, and get my father's finger, come to the hospital. <laughs> my father's like, who is this? <laughs> is this Larry? <laughs> but he, so my father, though, realized this was his chance to finally win over his father-in-law. So he went to the garage, put the finger in a, hand, in a, a, a napkin handkerchief, got in the car, drove like a bat out of hell to the hospital. They rushed him in. He goes in the room. It's the doctor, the nurse, my mother, and pop up laying on his thing. And the doctor says, do you have the finger? He goes, yes, I do right here. Takes it out. Takes it out. <laughs> I know I have it here somewhere. <laughs> Can you imagine what was going through his mind? When he's going to, he looked for a while. Um, this isn't some scary folk story where the finger reemerges, you know, coming up in his bed at night. And sure. <laughs> we never found the finger. Yeah, it never did. It's rumored to be inching its way to the finger legs. We, we, we never found the finger. What they wound up doing was uh, they sedated Pop Up because he got upset. <laughs> and what they did was they took a piece of, bo of his body that he would least miss from his ass. They attached it to his finger. So he had this kind of gruesome looking butt finger. 
Now we were we were kids at the time, so we had lots lots of nicknames. We had other nicknames. We had uh, Heine, Heine Hand, uh, Tush Digit, and my personal favorite was Rumpelstiltskin because just for kids, the word rump just just sounded funny. Pop Up's basic attitude: he was furious that no one had any sympathy for him. Because all anybody cared about was, did you hear what Frank did? <laughs> and that was the big joke in the family. Now my father, you have to understand my father's whole philosophy to life is, is you look at the donut. His philosophy is, you look at the donut in life, not the whole. You, you appreciate what you have, you don't worry about what you don't have. And, and it's a good philosophy. He used it about the bankruptcy, about his heart condition, about the fact that Papa Pet, you know, this happened. And my father was like, he got nine and a half fingers, what's the big deal? I mean, it's, why are you making a big fuss? Now my father um, eventually got back on his feet. So we were, I was in fifth grade and he got back on his feet financially, so we moved back to Philadelphia. So uh, we're staying with him, but we would still see pop up on like holidays where the whole family would gather. And they would extend the dining room table out so everybody could sit there and it'd be the uncles and the cousins. And pop up would be in his glory because he'd be cutting giant portions of meat for everybody at the table except for one person. <laughs> so, so what would happen is he put this tiny little sliver of meat on a plate and we would pass from uncle to uncle to cousin to cousin all the way down to the end of the table and they'd all be snickering until it finally got to where my father sat but he never complained. Now that's my story. Now two things. One, when I told the story the first time, this is an, and you guys all did wonderful tonight. Really, I, 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 you were wonderful. Uh, at first time it's, it's amazing. When I told the story, a lady in the first row, when I mentioned the part about his finger getting off, cut off, she says out loud, that's not funny. <laughs> so I step back, like, she like, like a little jab to my face. So I get to the end of that part, and the lady then turns to her loved one and is like, glorious day? <laughs> what kind of sick person is this guy? <laughs> and let me explain. The reason it's a glorious day for me is my, I am now the age, I just had a birthday a couple weeks ago, I'm the age my father was when he passed away suddenly. And the thing about that is I look at the donut because my kids never got to meet my father, but anytime they meet anybody who knew my father or knew of my father, the first thing out of those people's mouths to them is, do you know the finger story? <laughs> and they launch into this whole tale, their own version of the story, which my kids have heard way too many times. And my kids politely nod. And as they're telling that story, for a few moments, my father, my mother, my grandfather, all who've been long gone, are resurrected. Right. And, and that's what stories do. And part of the whole thing here is my grandfather, yeah, he sacrificed a finger, but for a slice of immortality. And, and, and the thing is that at the end of the story, when they wind down, wind down and the guy says to my kids, that's Frank Carmen, he was something. And then my kids turn and they look at me and they smile. And for a few moments, my father is to them what he's always been to me, which is larger than life. Thank you.